they are now approaching that uh, point on the left side of the moon as we face it where they will go around the other side of the moon again. That will happen in 15 minutes from now. On that far side of the moon, when they're given the go-ahead uh, by ground control, which uh, we have not heard that they have gotten as yet, they will fire their SPS, Service Propulsion System engine, 20,500 pounds of thrust of it for a quick nine second burst, just enough to lower their paracynthium, uh, or rather lower their apocynthium, their high point around the moon, uh, and go into a circular orbit. In Moscow, uh, Bill Cole, our CBS News correspondent there, is standing by and perhaps can give us a report on how the Russians have taken this American achievement in space. Bill? There's been a lot of praise for the bravery of the astronauts over here, but also there have been very serious doubts placed on the outcome of the Apollo mission. Soviet official sources have hinted that uh, it's much too risky and premature for the United States to try now. They stress strongly that Soviet lunar spacecraft have already made the trip around the moon with automatic control systems. Yesterday, Boris Petrov, who's a leading space expert here, said in the first official report that a main feature of Apollo seems to be that it requires human hands to guide it, in contrast to Soviet vehicles. Uh, Bill? Yes, Walter. Uh, I, I wonder if uh, Dr. Georgi Petrov was uh, was uh, reported in full uh, or translated in full uh, or whatnot because it would seem that he should know that the American spacecraft can be automatically guided as well. Now it's not a fully automated spacecraft in the sense that we have put men aboard because that's the concept of American uh, inter uh, space travel uh, but uh, it can be guided back to a safe landing uh, even if these men are incapable of operating the machinery, as I understand it. That's true, but the stress, the thing that he stressed, was the fact that Soviet vehicles have already made the trip around the moon, and the American craft has not been tried. Well, uh, aside from the scientific community in the Soviet Union, what about the man on the street? Uh, your chauffeur who took you down to uh, the broadcast studio today. Did he, uh, did he have anything to say about this flight? He had nothing at all to say about it. In the Soviet press, uh, Russians are getting very brief, factual, even cold accounts of the Apollo 8 mission. But uh, in all fairness to them, uh, that's even more than they give their own space missions. The Soviet cosmonaut is a hero only when he returns after a successful flight. Uh, there have been uh, still no radio or television reports, only uh, the brief printed word? Very, very brief reports on radio and television. For example, this morning it wasn't even mentioned that uh, Apollo 8 would uh, reach the moon today. Uh -huh. And uh, they haven't picked up any of the European Broadcast Union's uh, relays from this side of our full reporting of the flight? Not at all, but we hear uh, here in Moscow that uh, many of the uh, satellites countries, I mean the other communist countries, are getting uh, very uh, regular reports on the mission, and some of them have even seen uh, the Eurovision uh, television reports, but they haven't been shown here. Well, there were some reports uh, earlier uh, that the Soviet Union might be prepared to go when their window to the moon opened early in this month, uh, and they did not, as we now, of course, know. Uh, did you get the impression, or is the impression widespread in the Soviet Union that they were uh, planning to go at that time uh, and for some reason or other simply could not make the flight? Uh, or do you think that their plans really have not been to go at this early time? Most people feel here that they plan to go later, that they plan to let us uh, test the area, more or less. Well, we are doing that, uh, and so far, with great success. Uh, there's no doubt, I suppose, in Moscow that uh, this is a, a uh, great American achievement, that they have lost uh, at least a first in this particular regard. That's true. There have been compliments from the three major spatial spokesmen here today, all complimenting the uh, Apollo flight, but most newspaper comment seems uh, to cast doubt on the reliability of the Apollo craft, and also they point out the great dangers of overdoses of radiation to the astronauts. 
You know, it might be interesting uh, today to be out at that uh, space museum that uh, there in Moscow, just uh, on the other side of town, up uh, on the way to the airport, I think it is, if I recall I was, correctly. I was out there this morning. Were you? And, and no uh, excitement or comment about of the people viewing, uh, who are passing through the museum today as they viewed the, the great uh, achievements of their spacemen? No more than usual. Uh-huh. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Good night, Walter. Good night. Or if you don't mind, good morning from here. Good night to you <laughs> in Moscow. Earth time sequences uh, are a little bit hard to accept today when we're talking about lunar time sequences. And now the spacecraft has moved into the lunar night, is passing through the lunar night, and has been for the last uh, hour uh, or so as it approaches the far side of the moon. It'll go around the leading side of the moon again and back uh, for its uh, third pass uh, behind the moon when it will circularize its orbit if they get a go-ahead, which I have not heard so far, that they have. Uh, it is expected that they will. However, they've been feeding up all of the engineering data and the computer data required by the spacecraft to fire off that engine on this pass behind the moon. Steve Rowan, perhaps you can and uh, Dr. Jastrow uh, can tell us some more about the moon, uh, uh, about that green cheese it's supposed to be made of. <laughs> well, we know it's it. not that nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we? Yes, we do. Green because, cheese uh, is what it's made no, of. No, it's rock. A uh, uh, surveyor uh, carried an instrument which, carry, which uh, performed a uh, basic chemical analysis and showed the materials to be the materials uh, of rocks on the Earth. Let's talk about some of the other um, sort of popular misconceptions. Uh, for example, what about an atmosphere? Was there ever a lunar atmosphere? Could there be? The, there uh, may have been at the very beginning, but the moon's gravity is so uh, weak that uh, most of this atmosphere would have disappeared in a very short time, even short on a scale of, let's say, 10 to 100 million years, uh, which is in turn short compared to the lifetime of the moon. Uh, there may have been water at the very beginning surrounding the moon because water is a common substance in the cosmos, we think. And there's a lot of it, no doubt, trapped in the moon's body. Well, now, if there's, if there's water trapped in the moon's body and if under the surface of the moon the temperatures are reasonably uh, comfortable, yes. uh, could there not perhaps be life? Uh, couldn't there be colonies of some kind under the surface of the moon? Possibly so. I, uh, there's a photographic... Uh, indication of what looks like riverbeds, dried riverbeds, if, if uh, it can be shown on camera. Um, it's a photograph taken by Lunar Orbiter, uh, which shows in the uh, upper corner of a part of the photo uh, a, uh, a, a rail that, uh, that does look like a dried riverbed. It probably isn't. That is, it's probably some geological uh, uh, surface feature. But there's a bare possibility that for a brief period in the moon's early history, there was uh, water on the surface. And it's a possibility so significant for the prospect of life on that body that, that we have to keep it in mind and not exclude it. That leads to the question of how, again, of how the, the moon got there. Uh, could it have been a piece of the Earth uh, whirled off into space when the Earth was a molten ball, that, as we learn in school? That, that's one favorite theory, that it came out of the Pacific Ocean, but but uh, there's good evidence against it. It's more likely that both the moon and the Earth condensed under the action of their own gravity out of cold gas and dust in space. Uh, in which case you might ask, why are we taught in school that the Earth, and presumably the moon, when uh, young, were molten balls of rock surrounded by clouds of steaming vapor, which gradually cooled to form a solid crust? Weren't they? Uh, we don't know. We hope to find out through the study of the moon. The, we don't know whether the Earth was formed hot or cold, and likewise the moon, and we'd, we'd like to know these things because, again, they're connected to the question of the conditions under which life evolved on this planet. Uh, Dr. Jastrow, uh, aside from the possibility of uh, there being enough heat uh, deep in the, uh, uh, in the moon to sustain some form of life, what about the possibility that has been suggested, I've seen somewhere, uh, that uh, it is so cold in, the, in some of the rills and uh, crevices of the moon that there's a possibility of uh, frozen air, frozen water, uh, ice in these areas that we might actually be able to drill into, uh, into frozen air, 
<laughs> not yeah. liquid, but solid uh, uh, air, oxygen. Well, I, I think not frozen air because the, uh, although it gets very cold in, uh, on the moon in the night, uh, a, a foot or two beneath the surface, the temperature approaches a, uh, a standard year-round average, which is quite comfortable. I think it's uh, some degrees below zero, but not terribly cold. Um, there might be uh, ice at some point uh, under the moon's uh, surface. It's just barely possible because there must be water there. There's certainly water in the rocks. And uh, these are all long shots, but it's the long shots that pay off, some of them. We Go won't know.